Hi guys, welcome to Ute Dash. I am Sammy Mora. I am one of your hosts for today. I am the sports editor at the Daily Utah Chronicle here in Salt Lake. And today I am joined by Cole Bagley, my assistant sports editor for the Chronicle. So we're just gonna jump right into it. Fall sports, not happening. Was that the right move for the Pac-12? Cole, take it away. Absolutely not. Um, the decision to cancel fall sports to me just seemed like there was a huge lack of effort um, on the conference's end of trying to put together uh, a plan in which fall sports um, would take place. And the thing I worry about most is how are the athletes going to uh, play two seasons um, in 2021 with um, a potential of a spring season and a fall season, as well as what are going to be some of the financial repercussions um, that take place because of this. Honestly, I think this was the smartest idea that the Pac-12 has had in a while. Um, there's They've cited a lot of things that like the Big Ten also cited. Um, the heart condition, the testing protocols. It was the smartest thing to do. You don't know how this is going to react. And especially we're seeing that like as these colleges are reopening now, a lot of these students aren't taking things seriously. Like in Tuscaloosa, there's pictures of big parties happening and stuff like that. So I think it was the smartest idea because as much as these athletic trainers and these coaches can keep these players safe, you don't know what Tommy in the in-person business class that Britton Covey has, if he's been following safety protocols, if he's been wearing a mask, like you don't know what he's doing. So... Yeah, no, that that's that's absolutely a valid point. You know, it's it's a, a much different situation than you know professional sports. You know, an NBA bubble, an NHL bubble. Uh, it's a, it's a lot easier to control what's going on. Um, a bubble doesn't seem exactly possible um, with with collegiate sports. Uh, but to me, I just feel like they're they didn't really try. Um, to to put anything into place to to make any sort of plan to to put any sort of regulations or uh really even attempt to uh make a season happen and i just i really worry about um the effects that that's going to place on on college sports on the ncaa um and the conference as well and just how much money uh is probably going to be potentially lost i mean are, are we looking at uh the, like how legitimate is um, our two seasons for, for, for the year of 2021? Uh, you know, when, when would you start the spring season and, and how long of an off season are you really going to be able to provide uh, for these players before they start the fall season? Yeah. And you can't like, you can't start a season in April or in March because the NFL has already stated that they're not going to be moving their combine. They're not going to be moving the draft. And then you have those kids who are going to opt out of the season if it starts in March or April. So I think honestly, the best thing to do is do a condensed season. There's no way they're going to play 10 games. Maybe not even, they're not even probably going to be able to play 12. I would say eight games is probably the soft, like the sweet spot of like games that they can play because you got to think about weather, inclement weather conditions, especially here in Utah when it can snow, like it snowed the day after I was born in May. So it's like, you got to learn about these inclement weather. And especially with teams like Colorado, Utah, Washington, you don't know what the weather's going to be like. Exactly. And that, and that's my worry is when can you legitimately start a season? I mean, you, you can go to the athletes and you can say, all right, January, as soon as the semester starts week one, you know, we're going to have football, but I just, I don't think that's the best, best idea. Sure. You know, in, in the fall, you know, you've got games in October and November that, you know, there's plenty of snow. I mean, oftentimes Utah's playing Colorado and regardless of where the game is, there's a couple, you know, there's a few feet of snow on the ground. Um, but starting, in January just doesn't seem possible to me. And so I think the latest you can, you know, the earliest you probably want to start is maybe early February, mid February. Um, and yeah, you're right, Sammy, you're going to have to play a, a condensed season, um, you know, eight games, probably max, uh, because if you're not able to do that, um, you're not, there's not going to be an off season for these guys. And what kind of a quality season are we going to have in the fall uh, of 2021? But I think also playing in the spring brings up the like the point about what about early enrollees for like the kids that sign in December, their NLIs and their early enrollees are should they be allowed to play in the spring? Because if this was a normal situation, they would be allowed to practice in the spring. But would they be allowed to play? I don't think it's fair to let them play, because if in reality, if you think about it, they'd get five seasons. So you'd get the spring season. And then if they play again in the fall, you're going to get the fall season. Plus, if they stay all four years of their like time at Utah, they're going to get upwards of five seasons. So I don't think it's fair that you let the, if they're an early enrollee, if they play in the spring, they're not, they shouldn't be allowed to play. They should be allowed to practice, but not play. Well, do you, do you think that 
that the conference is going to be looking at an issue where they might have, you know, some guy, you know, I mean, look at, look at some of the seniors, um, you know, going into their senior season, are, are they going to want to play in the spring with, with, um, with the combine, not, you know, not too far off and, and a potential to be drafted? Are they going to, are they going to accept that extra year of eligibility? You know, so, so, you know, are we going to need, are we going to need those new signees? Are you going to need to play those guys because you might be looking at roster issues? Yeah. And I think that also goes to like, which juniors, if, if juniors are eligible to declare, are they going to declare? Cause then you're going to get into scholarship count issues. And then this whole thing is just, it's setting up to be kind of a big mess. If you really think about it, because you're going to have the scholarship count issues, you're going to have to decide if it's even worth it to play in the spring, or even if they should just do just a regular spring camp and shoot for the fall. There's still so many questions. This is just turning into like a big mess. And honestly, it's going to be really interesting to see how the NCAA or if the NCAA says anything about anything going on with this, how they're going to react. Yeah. So if you do, if you do a spring season, I think there needs to be an attempt at some sort of bubble. Um, you know, we don't know exactly where things are going to be with COVID. You know, they could be the same as today. They could be completely different. You know, what, what kind of impact is a vaccine going to have? When's a vaccine going to be available? And so, you know, is there, is there a possibility to do maybe, you know, to split the conference in half, you know, North and South, um, you know, have those teams play each other and then maybe rotate three of the teams so that you, you know, you get about a, an eight, nine game season. Um, and, and it's just, and it's not just North and South. You've got, you've got a little bit of a mix. Plus, like you said, Sammy, it's, it's really going to be difficult to, to watch these, watch these guys, you know, what are these college athletes doing when they're not um, out, out on the fields, you know, it, you know, um, playing their games, you know, are, are they going to parties? Are they, you know, uh, like, like, um, like you mentioned earlier, you know, there, there was issues with, um, you know, athletes going to, to, uh, clubs and bars and, and tons of them coming down with COVID. So how do you control that? I think the PAC 12 and conferences all over the nation are going to need to look at some sort of bubble, at least for football, because I think it just, there's too many potential issues that would arise if, if you're not controlling what's going on um, out, off the field for these athletes. But where do you put the bubble cities? Because if you really think about it, the Pac-12 has two states that are really high in cases right now in California and Arizona. Do you, you obviously aren't going to put your bubble cities in those two places. So then do you put it in Boulder? Do you put it here in Salt Lake? Because Salt Lake is proven that they can host professional sports. The NWSL tournament was in a bubble here in Salt Lake. Um, the professional lacrosse league from the U.S. was also here in Salt Lake. So Salt Lake has proven that they can handle having a bubble city. Um, I've heard people talk about Seattle. So where do you put these bubble cities? Because it's going to need to be a good a place that the risks out that the rewards outweigh the the risks. If that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you've got to have somewhere that permits it weather-wise, that um, caters to having a bunch of athletes come in. Um, and and I agree with you. I think Utah, you know, Salt Lake City could be um, a place to to bring, you know, maybe the Pac-12 South. Um, and, you know, maybe you do look at, at Seattle um, or Portland to, to take the North. Um, but I, I just, I, I worry about college football. I worry about, you know, what it's going to look like, even though they did, you know, push off fall into, you know, potentially into spring. I just don't know, you know, exactly where, where you go with that and how you make a season happen and how you make two seasons happen um, in the same year. That That's my, that's, that's the biggest reason that I think um, this wasn't the best decision. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we, we were, we're uh, worried about making sure that these athletes are, you know, healthy and, and, and safe, but at the same time, you got to try, you got to try to do something. There's too much at stake. There's uh, not only for the athletes, but as well, you know, money wise. I mean, the university of Utah, I was reading the other day, it looks like they're going to lose $60 million because um, there's not going to be any fall sports. Yeah. And it's just, it's like, we, I feel for all these fall student athletes as much as I felt for the spring ones as well. Like this, it's just, this situation was something that is not what they expected. And honestly, I think that now that the Pac-12 and even the Big Ten has more time to like make a more solid plan because obviously they were running into this, in my opinion, like with their hands tied behind their backs. They didn't know what they were going to do. But, you know, we'll see how this plays out. But 
spring sports, I think, is going to be the best option for the Pac-12 as of right now. So now we're going to jump on over um, recruiting. What's going on with Utah? Um, so, uh, actually, sorry, wrong topic. We're going to jump. When Utah does come back, who's going to be under center? Is it going to be Jake Bentley or Cam Rising? We have two really suitable options for Utah. So, Cole, who do you think is going to be under center? Uh, I believe, and I think it's 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 obvious, especially with um, – now the the amount of time um, that this player is going to have to mesh with the team, I think it's Jake uh, Jake Bentley. Um, you know, he is the senior South Carolina transfer um, who has played football, who has played college football, um, and had uh, he's put on some pretty good numbers um, at, at South Carolina. So so Jake Bentley uh, is the, is the starter for me. I honestly think it's going to be Cam Rising, um, even though he had to sit out last year due to transferring from Texas. You know. He was up in the booth with Andy Ludwig. He was learning the playbook. He has an extra year on Bentley with this book. Honestly, like, I get he hasn't had that many snaps. He took a couple of snaps in the Alamo Bowl when all hope was lost. But, you know, I think that he just has more of a grip on this playbook than Bentley would. Well, I, I think that's true to this up, up to this point. But with the season being canceled, you're giving Bentley, and I understand you're giving uh, Rising more time as well. Uh, but I just think experience is going to trump to trump all here. I mean, just looking at some of, of Bentley's stats at South Carolina, you know, he had a 63.3% uh, com uh, completion percentage, uh, over 7,000 yards. He averaged, uh, which in the three seasons he's there, is almost 2,500 yards. Um, a season, 54 touchdowns. So we're looking at 18 a season um, and 30 interceptions. So about 10 uh, every season of football. I just, when it, when it comes down to it, I just, I'm, I'm going to take a guy who has played a lot of football, who's taken snaps, especially um, the fact that I, uh, Jake Bentley seems to be the better passer. Um, and Utah has got just an absolute um, onslaught of offensive weapons, especially at the wide receiver positions. Yeah, and you got to look at with Rising, Covey, Britton Covey was with him for most of the season after Covey decided to take his redshirt year. So there's got to be a bond between the two of them in that capacity. Also, Rising practiced with the team all year. He played scout team quarterback. I just think that he is the heir apparent to the quarterback position, filling in that hole that was left by Tyler Huntley. It's just I can see why people would say that Bentley is going to be the smarter option because he has the experience, especially playing SEC football. Like, I just think, I think, ben, I think, yeah, rising. He's my guy. I like him. Well, do you, do you see a possibility of, of playing a dual, having a dual quarterback uh, offense? Um, you know, we, we've, we've gotten used to Tyler Huntley the past couple of years and um, you know, with Tyler, the passing game wasn't his strong suit. We obviously with, with Moss behind him, we're going to, we're going to put the, the football in, in Moss's hands. But I think, I think what Whittingham is looking to do is potentially transition a little bit to more, more of a passing game um, for, for whenever the next season happens because of, of the weapons that are on offense um, as far as, as guys that are catching the football. Um, I, and, and I just, I worry with, with Cameron and his lack of experience that he's going to be able to complete those passes. So what, what are your thoughts on, on maybe two quarterbacks? I honestly don't think, I don't, I don't see Andy Ludwig doing that. When you have someone, you have two very viable options at quarterback. You got to pick one. Um, someone's going to get upset about not being the starting quarterback, but at the end of the day, like that's how the game plays. And honestly, I don't think, I think depending, I don't think whoever the quarterback's going to be is going to like shift who gets touches on the ball. Brant Keithy has kind of set himself out as like one of the best tight ends in the country at this point. So I don't think that whoever's under center might affect that. We have very talented wide receivers who are going to catch the ball. So, yeah, uh, Sammy, you're touching on, on Keithy. It looks like we have a question from Ryan Root on the chat. Um, he asked, How do you think a new quarterback is going to affect Keithy's production? Um, I think Keithy, you know, I um, if I'm going to rank my my offensive weapons, the guys that are catching the football for the Utes, Britton Covey's a big question mark for me, and so I got Keithy at that number one spot, regardless of who's taking the snaps. Um, I do trust Jake Bentley more 
to put the ball in Keithy's hands um, more consistently. Um, but I think the, it doesn't really matter who's who's taking those, especially because we've also lost our, our superstar running back in Zach Moss. I do think that when football takes place, Utah is going to be more of, of a passing offense than we've seen in the last couple of years. And so I think Keithy's production is going to go up regardless of who who's 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 taking those snaps. Yeah, I agree, um, Cole, with that. I think Keithy, Keithy is one of my top two receivers that Utah has. The other one being um, Brian Thompson. Brian Thompson has proven himself to be that deep threat that Utah has kind of lacked in years past. So I think that I think that having both Keithy and Thompson healthy for the entire season, I don't think it really is going to matter who's behind center with that. But I wouldn't say that Utah is going to be more of a pass heavy offense also. Like you still have two really good running backs in um, Devin Brumfield and Jordan Wilmore. And I think that they're, they're, they're working, they're workhorses. I think that Utah is going to be still a very, I don't think it's going to be as run heavy as we've seen in years past, but I think it might be a 50, 50 split on the run pass option for Utah. Yeah, I I definitely can see that. Um, It's just to me, with with someone as talented as Bentley, especially coming in as a you know a senior transfer and, and a and a transfer that uh, Whittingham went after uh, very quickly and even got a, a commitment while Bentley was visiting the University of Utah, I just think passing is Bentley's strong uh, is his strong suit, and he's going to get that start in my opinion. And so I just I I think we might start to see um, the scale you know lean a little bit more towards towards passing offense than, than such a heavy a heavy rush. Yeah. And honestly, we still don't have a lot to base off of because Utah had two or three spring practices before everything came to a screeching halt. So we didn't really get to see, we got to see some stuff, but we didn't get to see a lot out of these quarterbacks. And I think that this was a battle that a lot of fans were really excited for, for this year. And I think no matter what it is, I think what, or when it happens, I think it's still going to be really interesting, but it also comes back to the question of eligibility. If they play in the spring, does Bentley take that extra year? If they don't play, like what is his deal? Because he might want to take his talents to the NFL. Whereas Cam still has a lot of eligibility. He'll still be, he'll be only be a sophomore this year. So does he stay? If we play in the spring, do we have a battle? Do we not? There's so many question marks with what the, what the quarterback position is going to be like at Utah still. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely correct. It's, it's, it's tough to make predictions when, training got cut so short and there's no season, uh, but it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a battle. Um, you know, these, these two guys I think are, are going to push each other to be even better. And I, I wouldn't even be surprised if maybe the first, you know, game or so we see a little bit of both, but knowing Whittingham, I think, I think he will have his decision made um, by, you know, whenever that first, whenever that first offensive set takes the field, uh, whether that's in in this next spring um, or or in fall of 2021, uh, I think Whittingham will know who his guy is. But you do bring up an interesting point. You know what what kind of effect is postponing you know the season going to have on Bentley? You know, is is he going to call it and just be done with football? Is he going to try to go to the NFL or is he is he in it for the long haul and really wants to to play a senior season um, at the University of Utah? And especially for Bentley, when his season came to a halt last year because of an injury, he hasn't had that opportunity to go out there and like fully finish a season especially I think playing in the SEC is vastly different than playing in the the Pac-12 and I think most people would agree with that but you got to see I want to see him play in the Pac-12 is what I would love to see whether it be him as QB1 or even if they run specialty packages with him or even rising if rising's not the starting quarterback does Ludwig draw up some special packages for rising to run kind of like they did last year with Jason with Jason Shelley they had some special packages that they would pull out every now and again to see to like throw defenses off so I want to see what Andy Ludwig Ludwig's plans are for both quarterbacks for sure and and it'll be it'll be an interesting battle um, to see how it goes down but Moving on to our next topic here, Sammy, you seem to know what's going on all the time with, with uh, the recruits that Utah's trying, trying to pull in. Uh, you know, can you bring us up to, up to date with, with how, that, how that recruiting trail is going for, for the U? Yeah, so COVID 
hasn't slowed Utah down on the recruiting trail. Um, we already have four really big commits for the program. The biggest one being a uh, four-star quarterback, Peter Costelli from California. He's a dual threat quarterback. He was one of the first pledges to Utah for this class of 2021. It's a huge get for the U. And now that they've kind of put their quarterback on lockdown, they can start building around him, getting the running backs, getting the wide receivers, getting some more offensive linemen. And Utah's already got a really good running back, too. They got Ricky Parks, who's a three-star running back from Tampa. Um, we all know how Utah is with running backs from Florida. Look at Zach Moss, our now all-time leading rusher and now in the NFL. So can Ricky be that next great running back in a line of Utah that Utah's had for quite a while now? Um, we also got Tavita Fotu, who's going to be a transfer from Snow College, the younger brother of Lecky Fotu, um, defensive tackle, is he going to be able to hold up that that Fotu name? He's the number one, um, he's the number two defensive tackle in the JUCO ranks. So we have that for him. And then rounding things out, we have um, Jonah Ellis, who a legacy commit from Utah. His dad, Luther Ellis, is one of the greatest linebackers in Utah football history. Um, Jonah is a linebacker as well. He committed to Utah, and he is the number one prospect in the state of Idaho. So I think Utah is setting up a really solid recruiting class right now, given everything that's going on. Um, Cole, what are your thoughts? Uh, the guy that I get the most excited about is, is Jonah um, Ellis, the three-star linebacker uh, from Idaho. And the reason is, you know, our offense, we've got a lot of um, we've got we've got an arsenal right now. We've got a lot of great players. You know, uh, once we bring on Peter Castelli, that's that's three that's three guys potentially um, going for the starting position, depending on what what happens with with this next spring. And so I, I really like Jonah because uh, he he's exactly what we um, are looking for to replace a lot of the the defense that we lost. Um, in this last year to the NFL. Now that's uh, that's obviously not a bad thing uh, to lose a lot of players to the NFL. It shows that the program is doing well and, pr and producing quality athletes. Um, but I like I like how he plays. Uh, I think he's really strong. I like that um, you know he's uh, football obviously runs well in the family. You know his dad playing uh, for for the U. You know his brother um, going to the Saints, and so he really excites me, especially with you know those stats. Um, you know, 104 tackles and 12.5 tackles for loss. I get really excited about Jonah, but what about you, Sammy? I am high on Tavita Fotu. Um, the Fotu family, they're some of the greatest football players, I think, that Utah's had in a while. Lecky, a beast, we know that. He's now playing in the NFL for the Cardinals. I've, I'm excited for Tavita. He had kind of a harder journey to get to Utah. He originally committed, but then academic issues, he couldn't make it eligibility-wise, so he went to Snow played a year at Snow, and now he's back here. I think that we both agree that Utah has one of has had a very strong defensive line for a long time, and I think that having Tavita on the team is just going to make that defensive line a little bit stronger. Um, so I think he's my biggest hype for the season for this recruiting class right now. Um, there's still a lot of kids that Utah's going after, some that were in their top five, top five, top eight. Um, Jeffrey Bossa, the safety from Currens High School here in Salt Lake, um, he's in there. Um, there's a lot of really good possibilities for Utah to end with a really, really, really solid class for this year. Oh, absolutely. Um, going back to sort of that quarterback battle, you know, what, Sammy, what do you think is going to happen if? Uh, Peter, you know, if if there's no spring season and we we again defer to a fall of 2021 where Peter Castelli is absolutely um, eligible to play, you know, if Jake Bentley stays around and you've got Rising and you've got Castelli, how do you think Castelli really compares to those two? Well, also, you're going to have to factor in Cooper Justice, who signed in the last class of 2020. He's currently on campus, too. Um, you wouldn't have if Drew Lisk, Drew Lisk would also be a scholarship quarterback for the U. So the U would have five quarterbacks on roster if there's no spring season and if Bentley and Lisk take their extra year of eligibility. So I think that I don't see Costelli redshirting, in my opinion. I think that he's going to come in and he's going to compete. If not for that QB1 job, definitely that QB2 job. Um, if Rising, if Rising, if Bentley leaves at the end of no matter what, it's going to be, it's going to go to rising. And I think that Costelli would fight for that QB two spot with Cooper justice. So Utah, Utah used to be kind of on the low on the quarterback side, especially last season. 
I think now we're kind of setting up to have a lot of quarterbacks with a lot of talent. And I think it would be really interesting to see how this goes down because I don't think Costelli is going to come to redshirt. I think he's going to come and he's going to try and fight for that starting job day one. Well, that, that's, that's definitely good information to, to hear and to know, because uh, one thing that I think that Utah has struggled with um, the last, mm, maybe, maybe close to the last 10 years, besides Tyler Huntley, I feel like we've struggled to really bring in a solid quarterback who um, goes above and beyond. And, you know, w- with a school like Utah, the success that they've had in the Pac-12, uh, the the amazing defenses that they've been able to produce year in and year out. I, I'd like to know that we've got that we're loaded at that at that quarterback position. That we have several guys that are going to have to you know fight tooth and nail to um, get that starting position. And I think Peter Castelli, like you said, I think he's going to come in. I don't see a redshirt happening here either. I think he's going to come in and he's going to fight to get that position. You know, obviously this is looking into the future a little bit. This is looking to probably the fall of twenty. 21 unless you know some sort of eligibility is allowed for for the spring but even even then I, I don't think it would be his position but I like him a lot as well and then uh, touching on on Ricky Parks just a little bit I love just like just like the University of Utah I love running backs from Florida uh, mm-hmm. and it's simply because of, of somebody like Zach Moss and I like the comparison I think he he could turn into Moss I think he has that work ethic that drive um, and I think, uh, you know, with, with the, the stats that he produced that you know, he went for over 1200 yards and 14 touchdowns, uh, I think, I think the, the U is going to be set with the, with this new, new round of recruits that they've got coming in. Yeah, totally. And especially we beat Iowa for Ricky. Um, Iowa's kind of going hard for him for a little bit. And then Utah came in and got him. And I think it's really good that we landed him. Um, it kind of gives us a little bit more depth in the running back position, even though we have quite a few backs on the roster. Of course, you have Brumfield, Brumfield, Brumfield and Wilmore, like we mentioned before, but you also have TJ Green, you have Makai Bernard. So you get that extra depth in that running back position, especially because Kyle McDonald, I think this, I think the next time Utah plays, I don't think they're doing a one-back system. I think you're going to do a two-back system with Brumfield and Wilmore because they're two vastly different rushers. So I think having different types of rushers for different types of situations is exactly what Utah needs. And Ricky fits into some of those categories that I think would be really good for Utah to have. Yeah, it's definitely definitely a situation um, that you have to look at and be really uh, be really excited about this recruiting class. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is one of the best recruiting classes we've seen, you know, potentially since Huntley and um, and Moss. You know, these are all guys that I think are 100 in for the University of Utah. I think that they're going to fulfill those roles, the, you know, the best way that they know how. And I think, you know, obviously Whittingham knows how to produce. NFL level players. And I think each of these guys should be excited to be, uh, you know, playing, playing for him. Yeah. And especially like, we all know that star rankings at the end of the day sometimes don't matter. And I think that Utah has really proven themselves as a team that can take a two star or a three star talent and put them into the NFL. It doesn't matter what that star ranking says. It matters what you come in and you do to the program. And I think these, a lot of these guys are going to be set up to do some really good things for Utah football in the future especially whenever we come back. Absolutely. It, but the biggest thing for me is, you know, with, with this recruiting class, can Whittingham not only take these guys and give them the best shot at the, at, at an NFL um, career, but can we finally get to the PAC 12 championship and win? You know, can we, can we finally get over that hump of, of, of dominating, dominating the South um, and then producing a PAC 12 championship? Because I think that, I think I, you know, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of Utah fans that we have great talent. We've got a fantastic coaching staff. They take these lower, you know, these lower, um, these lower guys that aren't looked at as much by, by, you know, Alabama and, and, you know, you know, those, those dominant top programs, but then we produce amazing athletes that go to the next level. But the biggest question is, can we take, can we take these guys and, and, and win a PAC 12 championship? Totally. I completely agree with that. I think that's the biggest thing that Utah, that's the the next hurdle that Utah has to make. So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for watching Ute Dash. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Dash Sports TV and our website at dashsports.tv. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you guys next week.